After World War II, increased Soviet influence in Hungary led to the revolution of 1956, which saw thousands flee abroad, including Pushkas and several of his Hongved teammates, who were in Spain at the time for a European Cup tie. Initial reports suggested Pushkas had died, but he turned up alive and well in Austria and then crossed the border into Italy. He stayed in Milan for quite a while in order to become registered as a player. But the Federation didn't give him permission to stay. I don't know if it was for political reasons. I don't think anyone knew. So after a while, when it was obvious the problem wasn't about to go away, he left for Spain. Specifically, the Spanish capital, Madrid. He was 31 at the time, but Real Madrid were keen to offer him a contract. Looking back, it was a wise decision, but one which had his teammates, who called him Pancho, raising their eyebrows at first. He'd spent two years without playing competitively, apart from when they played amongst themselves. So Pancho became fat. Pancho, when he arrived, was overweight, so we called him fatty. But he knew how to adapt to circumstances, and he played in a position that he wasn't used to, as a striker instead of a central midfielder. At first he was chubby, then he became a phenomenon. Firstly as a footballer and secondly as a person. Extraordinary. He was a key player for our team because he was someone who could shoot from a long way out, 30 to 35 metres from goal and score. Pushkas soon shared the extra pounds and formed an instant understanding with Di Stefano. The Hungarian took Spain by storm. He began with a hat-trick on his debut and helped Real Madrid to five successive league titles and finished as Spain's leading scorer on four occasions during his eight seasons there. He was so quick over the first five to ten metres. Besides, he was very intelligent. He looked up, had a great touch. He wore gloves on both feet. But the highlight of his career in the Spanish capital was the 1960 European Cup final against Eintracht Frankfurt in Glasgow. Real had won the trophy every year since the competition's inception in 1955. Their West German opponents had destroyed Rangers of Scotland 12-4 on aggregate in their semi-final. Madrid were determined to make it five in a row and their superiority soon became apparent. Pushkas's fabled left foot helped the Spaniards take a 3-1 half-time lead. The second half belonged to one man, Ferenc Pushkas. He scored a further three goals in 15 minutes to make the score 6-1. Even today, he's still the only man to have scored four times in a European Cup final. That performance just served to underline his standing as one of the world's greatest goal scorers. They were part of the 200-plus he scored for the record Spanish champions in all competitions over eight years. Di Stefano also helped himself to a hat-trick as Real went on to complete a 7-3 triumph. In the Glasgow final, he scored four, I scored three. He beat me by one, he was outstanding. You can't compare his game with Alfredo's, simply because Alfredo roamed all over the field and Pancho was the man who finished off in the last 25 metres and the opposition penalty area. When Pancho received the ball, it was almost certainly a goal. Pushkas played in two more European Cup finals for Madrid, against Benfica two years later and into Milan in 1964, losing on both occasions. He did pick up winners' medals in 1959 and 66, though he didn't play in either final. When Real lost to Benfica in that final in 62, Pushka scored all of their goals in a 5-3 defeat. But Eusebio scored twice to help the Portuguese club retain the trophy. Although Pushkas' second hat-trick in a European Cup final helped establish him as one of the all-time greats, his quest for World Cup glory that same year also ended in failure. He'd taken out Spanish citizenship in order to represent his adopted nation at that year's tournament in Chile. 
but Spain were knocked out in the first round. Win or lose, though, he never changed as a person. We used to have a chuckle because he'd often put his hand in his pocket and hand out money. He even handed out clothes. Sometimes he'd take off what he was wearing and give it to a Hungarian beggar, whom he'd then embrace, have a glass of wine with, and they'd cry because it was very emotional for the Hungarians to meet one another, embrace and have a drink. Puskas remains a Real Madrid legend even today, but despite his goal-scoring exploits around half a century ago, his compatriots living at home under communist rule had no idea of his achievements at that time. It was absolutely isolated. So there was even not a single news in Hungary about how the Real Madrid is successful, how they were able to win the highest uh, uh, cups of the European Championship. So, you know, he was absolutely isolated. So the, the communist regime was able technically and physically to block and isolate uh, even the biggest Hungarian serving outside uh, in Real Madrid. So we were absolutely no information about it. How times have changed. Today, Pushkas is regarded as a hero, and his legacy is very much in evidence back home. The National Stadium, formerly the Nipsch Stadion, was renamed the Pushkas Ferenc Stadion in 2001. Ironically, the man himself helped plant the foundations back in the 1950s. He was one of the workers who built the stadium in the 50s. Uh, because it was a marketing action by the communist government to, to invite uh, the famous uh, athletes and uh, football players to uh, build a stadium. Of course, it was one or two hours and no more, but uh, it was a symbolic thing. The Pushkas name also lives on at one of the country's leading football academies, which is named after him. Its founder hopes that the Pushkas legend will inspire today's generation and those to come. We would like to build a, a, a brighter future for the Hungarian football, and uh, we need uh, great players from the, from the past uh, who can uh, testify a uh, fabulous example for the young generation. Puskas is definitely the number one. Janos Banfi runs another academy for youngsters, Buda Juniors. He's a former Hungarian international who played under Pushkas when he was the interim manager of Hungary for a four-game spell in 1993. He's a huge legend of uh, Hungarian football. Since it's free to talk about him, he's, he's just become all of a sudden uh, Hungarian biggest person. I say this because when I was a young boy, a young footballer, you know. We knew him, but we didn't know much about him because obviously he was uh, hidden in Spain somewhere. And the legend itself is uh, still, still on. So wherever I go, I mean, travel the world, if I say, oh, I'm coming from Hungary, they say, yeah, Pushkas. <laughs> Banfi, like Pushkas, also captained the national team and remembers when Hungary, with Pushkas as manager, visited Ireland in 1993 for a friendly. And all of a sudden, the crowd just went crazy, you know, like all clapping or screaming. And I said, oh, yeah, they like us really a lot here. But then I realised that Ferenc Puskas walked out of the dugout, you know what I mean? He walked on the page, he greeted the people. I think he walked to the middle and then he walked to the bench. And till he sit down, the, the, the crowd just never stopped. So then it hit me that, OK, that he's really a hero. I remember uh, when Pelé scored his thousandth goal. I was um, in Hungary and I, I was speaking to, with Pushkas for some reason. I think we were at a function, and uh, and I said, "Isn't that marvellous, Pelé? Pelé scoring his thousandth goal? You know, a thousand goals." And he says, uh, "I I scored a, my thousandth goal about six years ago." The days when Ferenc Pushkas and his fellow magnificent Magyars took football by storm are long gone. For too long now, Hungarian football fans have had nothing to cheer at both club and national team level. All they have are the memories provided by Pushkas and his teammates. They wanted to make Hungary more popular all over the world by using a famous actor, Tony Curtis, who originates from Hungary. 
If Ochi had not been ill at the time and had been used instead, we would have been a thousand times more successful than we were with poor old Tony Curtis when the film was eventually finished. After retiring in 1966, Pushkas embarked on a globe-trotting career in management, taking charge of clubs in Spain, the United States, Paraguay and Australia, amongst others, as well as that brief spell in charge of the national team in 1993. The highlight was leading the Greek side Panathinaikos to the European Cup final in 1971. But it's for his performances on the field that he'll be best remembered and his kindness off it as well. Pushkas always remained a spiritually and friendly person and a good man. And when you lose, uh, a good man is always a great loss. He went home to Hungary in 1981. The country welcomed him back with open arms. And his funeral summed up just how much he meant to his people. He was king. He was the best footballer. Everybody paid attention to him, and he paid attention to everybody too. While I was looking for De Stefano to get his shirt, I came across Pushkas. He said to me, well done. I played with your father. You are worthy of him. So I'm going to give you my shirt. From then on, it became the most important shirt I own. Pancho, as a player and a person, well, I think he was an even better person than he was a player. He was out of this world. Out of this world. Ferenc Puskas may be gone, but he's far from forgotten. He's a national hero who spearheaded Hungarian football's finest times, the most magnificent of Magyars.